each other and uh, yeah and then ultimately show how AI pulls it all very neatly together so hmm Um, I have a mic. It doesn't? Oh, okay. Has it started recording? Yes. Nice. Sorry. Okay, cool. It's not loading up. It's okay. Okay, originally I wanted to do like a, I'll draw as I go, but I think now I have to type as I go. Um, let's just use, Okay, cool. Okay, one size. All right. Okay. Uh, can someone explain to me what IoT means? What's your at least what's your understanding of IoT? Show of hands. Volunteer. Yeah, but what does it mean? What does it mean if, let's say, I'm a startup and I tell a venture, capitali uh, venture capitalist that you know I run an IoT startup? What are they expecting from me? Yeah, correct. So I think essentially what IoT means is that I have a lot of sensors, right? And then these sensors are collecting data, and then it's sending this, uh, this all this data to the internet, which is essentially the cloud. So that gives us cloud computing, right? Which is another buzzword as well. So previously they were like, okay, sure, let's come up with as many uh, IoT devices and IoT devices that monitors like your body, like your heartbeat, whether you are going to, uh, that you're breathing heavily, how well you sleep and all these kind of things. People have been trying to collect all this data and sending it to the cloud. So when you pair up IoT with cloud computing, what kind of problem arises? Anyone? Any? 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 Anybody? Let's keep this conversational, by the way. It's just a bit strange for me to just talk to one way. Security, security right? Okay. So we had the problem of, let's say, cybersecurity. What other kinds of problems do we have? Privacy. Sorry? Privacy. Privacy, I think that comes under cyber security. Uh, sorry? Standards. What kind of standards? Like if you send a command, this device reads it the same way as another device. I don't quite understand. What do you mean? Uh, like a unified platform that every device can appear to. Uh huh. So the how each device talk to each other, the product communication protocol, right? So I think in terms of communication protocol, we can kind of classify it as network bandwidth, right? Also, it falls under the whole section of network bandwidth. Communication protocol not so not such a big problem because you can always modify the protocol. But in terms of network bandwidth, to say that you know. If I am sending every single tiny detail to the cloud, is it efficient? 
for example, if all like okay, your internet bandwidth, right? You can only send that much data per second. You can't send unlimited data. So what happens if I have a sensor strapped to my wrist, one to my head, one to my feet, one to my arm, and you want to send everything on the same network bandwidth? You can't have a clock up uh, there, right? So then we have the network bandwidth error. It's like, yeah, yeah, so much data. You're collecting so much data, but then can you actually send it fast enough to the cloud to actually process it in real time to give you uh, the, the, the results back? So that's another problem. What's another problem that you can think of? Scalability. Scalability? Uh, yeah. So okay, when we talk about scalability, uh, this one's a little bit tricky. We are looking at how I, how I would phrase scalability, it's kind of like centralization, right? You are sending everything out to the cloud. You are trusting, let's say, Amazon to do all the processing over there. So how it works is that, you know, there is a whole server room of, of big computers doing all this data processing, etc. It's all in a central location, you know, somewhere that, you know, uh, totally far away. So the problem with that is that what if you know, somebody hacks into it. What if that server, you know, fails and what if it falls, right? So that comes the problem of decentralization. Okay. So decentralization. So when you talk about decentralization, we are talking about decentralization of data and decentralization of computing power, right? So if you have decentralization of computing power, it means that you know, um, you know, instead of having everything processed in one place, you can have it maybe uh, a little bit here, a little bit there, etc. As for as for decentralized information, decentralized data, you know, you, if you if you don't have like one mega place that stores all your data, it's kind of like distributed everywhere. It becomes ideally safer, right? So okay, with IoT and cloud computing, we have these three big problems. So out of these three big problems, we now, it now gives rise to new technology, right? So now we're going to look at the new buzzwords that solve these uh, three big problems. Okay, so from cybersecurity and decentralization, what do we have? We have blockchain, right? Anyone here familiar with blockchain technology? So you have things like, okay, so a uh, show of, okay, anyone can explain to me blockchain? In like the most simplest layman term, in like a one sentence kind of thing. Database. Correct. So decentralized database. So the idea of blockchain is that now, I store a little bit of information with you, and I store a little bit of information with you, and a bit of information uh, everywhere, and then like, it essentially becomes safer where the other people can actually verify your data instead of having like, this whole big uh, governing body doing all the you know, data hogging. So the blockchain is kind of like literally blockchain because like, whatever you have a chain, you have blocks of information, and then you append to it, you append to it, and then you have a blockchain. And then, of course, uh, another buzzword from blockchain that you might hear about is like hard forks, which is kind of like you split the chain into like two chains, etc. But let's not go into that, okay? That's not uh, what I'm here to talk about today. But just to give you an idea of blockchain, what uses blockchain? So things like cryptocurrency, bitcoins, uh, Ethereum, uh, all these kind of things, where they're kind of like, they use blockchain technology. So blockchain is another buzzword that you're going to hear. So as long as you tell like an investor or like, oh, I'm doing a blockchain startup, okay, they're like, here, take my money. So it, it's a very hot topic that arises from cybersecurity and decentralization of very well put uh, database. Another thing that arises from this, so blockchain is kind of like the concept of it, right? Uh, where you, know, you develop, it's more of the software side of things uh, on how you, know, you store the data, etc. What about the computational power of it? So that gives rise to this thing called fork computing and what and edge computing. Okay, anybody knows the diff? Okay, any okay. Wait, sorry, I, I think I asked this. Only one person <laughs> knows what's edge computing. Okay, anybody here knows what's fork fork computing? Raise of hands. No. Okay. Never mind. Okay. Uh, the gentleman over there who said, you know, about edge computing. Could you just very, like, 
uh, briefly share with us what's your understanding. Well, it's just moving your processing power out to the edge of the network as opposed to centralizing some data centers. Very well put. So what he said just now is to move your data to the edge of the network, <coughs> right? So edge computing is really saying that, OK, you have your, OK, for, okay I'll talk about fault computing and edge computing interchangeably. Then later I'll tell you the difference between the two. So um, the cloud is here, right? You're sending, right now all the data is stored in the cloud. And then you have the source of generation of your data. So that's your IoT sensors, etc., cetera, where the, the source of data. And what's in between the source of data and the cloud? So to put a device right smack in the middle, uh, ideally closer to the edge of the data generation, the, the device generating the data, that's, where, that's your edge computing device. So the idea of an edge computing device or a fault computing device is that it's a physical hardware platform that actually aggregates all the nitty gritty data before sending it to the cloud. So what does that mean? It means that number one, it maximizes, uh, maximizes the network bandwidth, right? Because if let's say I want to do real-time processing, to send the data all the way to the cloud, you know, it takes maybe a few seconds for it to go there and then it come back. So in terms of time-sensitive decisions, in governing the security of, let's say, the airport, where you need to act in terms of milliseconds or in the factory process line, where you know, everything is being manufactured and things like that, uh, and flying past in terms of your packages, you cannot afford to be like, oh, one second here, one second here, one second here. It needs to go in real time. So that's the benefit of having an edge computing device. So what's the difference between fault computing and edge computing? Okay, this is my interpretation of it, okay? So fault computing is, some people, okay, it, it's quite controversial, this thing. Fault computing is, in my opinion, Cisco's way of saying that, no, it's not called edge computing. We came up with the concept of fault computing like how many years ago? We have right over it. So fault computing, the term was literally invented by Cisco. Nobody else, just Cisco. Edge computing is what the general public agrees on calling. So usually you hear the term fault computing is usually someone that's brainwashed by Cisco, okay? So, okay, so <laughs> why, why call fault computing? Here's my conspiracy theory, is that you have a cloud, and then you have the source of your, your, your source of data generation. What's slightly lower than the cloud is the fog. Okay, never mind. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I would really prefer if you call it edge computing. So edge computing, if you've um, been following the media, it's only recently gotten traction in the last five months. So for Sport Magazine calls it like the next multi-billion dollar industry, uh, how it, it suddenly and silently crept up and it's going to be the new thing. Who, uh, whichever IoT or, or AI startup that has edge computing would have an edge over the rest. Okay, So edge computing, it does aggregated data. So what we actually do at SmartCow is we actually we, uh, we build our own edge computing device. So I came up with the idea of edge computing like one year ago and that buzzword term did not exist. So I invented my own term called Distributed Intelligent Network System, <laughs> which is a, quite a mouthful to say. So now when I go into meetings, I just tell them, oh, we built edge computing device, they slightly get it. So the benefits of edge computing device, you know, because it's decentralized, right? You address the problem of scalability. <coughs> you can connect, think of it like Hydra, you know? with uh, one device, uh, one, one, one edge computing device connected to a lot of sensors, and then this device connected to another edge computing device, which is then connected to a lot of sensors, and then that device connected to another device with a lot of sensors, and so on and so forth. So what you have is your own distributed intelligent network system, i.e. isolated computational uh, system. So I've been in talks with, let's say, the government in Singapore, etc., uh, to actually form the whole distributed internet, uh, distributed intelligence system uh, for various projects. So what's the benefits of it? Is that it's very isolated. So all the processing happens on these devices itself. It doesn't get sent to the cloud. You may not necessarily connect it to the cloud. You can. So what's the limitations? Is that it's scalable in terms of 
you can connect one device to another. So if let's say one device has 1.5 teraflops, you connect it to another device, it has you know, three teraflops. But in terms of anal uh, analysis of historical data, right, it's not that good. Because it's limited to that processing power and it's limited to the onboard memory. Right? So that's the limitation. So in terms of, let's say I want to store, I want to archive a lot of this kind of data and, and uh, like the video network. Like if you're setting your cameras to like 60 frames per second, um, you want to store every single data, uh, you, know, you, know, you cannot just rely on the hardware itself on site. Uh, you need to kind of like send it elsewhere. So that's where the cloud computing comes into play, high performance cloud computing, so on and so forth. So uh, you got a good idea of edge computing. So talking about the hardware, who here actually knows about DNA computing and neuromorphic computing? Mm, have you heard of neuromorphic computing? Mm. Okay. So these are like new buzzwords that you're gonna hear probably in the next one or two years. It's starting to get traction already. Right now it's in the R&D phase, uh, morphic computing. I'll just quickly go through with you so that when you actually hear about these terms, right, you don't, it doesn't come as a surprise. All right, okay, wait. Uh, before I talk about neuromorphic computing and uh, GPU, com uh, as in uh, DNA computing, under edge computing and fault computing, you have three things, okay? You have another three buzzwords that you're gonna hear very often. First one is GPU. Next one is FPGA. The other one is ASICs. Right? So, right now, the buzz is GPU. <laughs> ASICs is more for blockchain, la, mining, right? Okay, so GPU, what's Anybody knows about GPU? I'm sure the gamers, the, okay, most, most guys. Okay, so GPU is pretty much, you know, you have your CPU, which does your whole computation, right? And then you kind of like outsource it to the GPU. So one is the master and one is kind of like the slave, right? So you outsource the task to the GPU. The GPU is very good at parallel processing. So it can actually process, imagine like instead of one processor doing the work, it spreads it out into like multiple tasks, so it can assign different threads within the GPU to do it, so it actually happens what you call parallel processing, and then once it's done, you bring it back to the CPU. So previously, you know, we, I mean, AI and, 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 and neural nets have existed for like, I mean, since my parents' generation, but it's only because of the recent breakthroughs in hardware computation that, you know, it's, it, it can actually power all this kind of data processing in real time. So the GPU, uh, right now the leader uh, is NVIDIA. Of course, they're facing tough competitions. Uh, more people are coming into the game, uh, the big boy. So like ARM, ARM has like ARM Mali. Uh, you have, uh, you know, uh, AMD with their Ryzen and like uh, a lot of other, a lot, uh, more, more players are coming into the GPU space. So GPU, I think right now is number one. Although people are exploring FPGAs now for in terms of uh, hardware things to do AI computation. So FPGA, in my opinion, is very tough to do. Uh, not worth going into yet, if let's say you're a startup. Maybe as a researcher, it makes sense. But FPGA, because FPGA is super duper hard to program on. And to be able to program FPGA, and to be able to program deep learning stuff, you kind of need to be competent in like both of them, and it's very rare to even just find someone competent in programming deep learning stuff. So FPGA plus deep learning is just like a really, really bad combo. Uh, you can't really find this talent in the market right now. Uh, if you can, it's very rare. And then ASICs, it's kind of like a custom board that's only built to do one specific purpose, right? So in terms of, let's say for uh, blockchain, like in terms of Bitcoin mining, have you heard of Bitcoin mining? It's people, you know, trying to um, mine bitcoins <laughs> to validate stuff. So, of course, when you want to validate it, it, it's a lot of by brute force kind of attacks and you just, a lot of processing power. That's why people kind of have like Bitcoin mining farms, you know, uh, based in China mostly. Um, 
So this, they built specific hardware just for one sole purpose, which is kind of like Bitcoin mining, etc. So you can also build a bot with one sole purpose to perform AI. But the thing about the ASICs bot is that once it's done, it's done. That's the only purpose. It's like, what is my purpose? Just that. It's quite sad, but then it's possible. So these are like some buzzwords that you're going to hear for the hardware architecture for uh, fork computing and edge computing. So as promised, I'll, go, I'll bring you very briefly through neuromorphic computing and DNA computing. Okay, this is really uh, very avant-garde, uh, to be honest. Uh, no legit product out there in the market right now, but um, a lot of the research is uh, within, is it IBM? I think it's IBM. Uh, IBM True North, is it? Or True Sense or something like that. Um, Okay, the idea of neuromorphic computing. So A star in Singapore has been looking into it. Uh, I have a friend who was leading the department for neuromorphic computing. So neuromorphic, when you when you talk about the word neuromorphic, neuro it reminds you of something like in your brain, right? Your neurons in the brain. So the idea of neuromorphic computing is how do you actually replicate the way your brain works, the cells that in your brain how it works into computer. So it's a bit like neuroscience, right? Uh, is it called neuroscience? I think so. So the idea is every single cell, in this case hardware device, will have its own processor and its own memory. So right now, if you look at a computer, it's like, okay, there's one processor here and then there's a memory here, but it's not the same thing. So a very vague concept of neuromorphic computing would kind of be like how you would scale with edge computing devices. It's like you have one edge computing device connected to another edge computing device and then it's here and there. I think that could be considered as a very early stages on neuromorphic computing because every edge computing device has its own processor and it has its own memory chip, right? So that being as one single node talking to another node with its own processor and memory is kind of like a, you know, like one brain cell talking to another brain cell. But I mean, in the most ideal situation, every single, like, every single thing within a chip, a neuromorphic chip, right, uh, would have it like that. So not so big, but like it's its own, like it's all like made into a small little silicon chip, right? So that's a really uh, interesting concept of neuromorphic computing. Nobody actually really nailed it down. Uh, was, it, was it IBM True North or something? You can Google it to find out more. They have been the leaders in terms of the, this neuromorphic computing, but they say that they have it, you know, but nobody actually seen it. Nobody outside of that company has seen it. So it's like, you don't know whether they're lying or they're not lying, uh, just to push up stock prices. Okay, the next part, DNA computing. Ah, DNA computing has been tied to the concept of memory, right? Well, let's talk about memory, memory storage, data storage. Um, yeah, people have been obsessed over how you store data, right? I mean, the last times your, 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 you, you've been stored, like one big floppy disk can only store how many bytes, and then now you can have like hard drive, SSDs, and then now you have M2 SATAs and stuff like that. DNA computing pushes it uh, one step further. Okay, so if you recall, DNA, in your DNA cell, your helix formation, you have the ATGC pairing, right? So A can only pair with T and then G can only pair with C or vice versa. So because there's only AT or GC, very much like binary, you have one zero or zero one, right? So it becomes very straightforward. It's like, okay, if let's say you can encode the ATGC pairing into ones and zeros, because it's either that or it's not that, right? you can actually reduce the size of your computational whatever, right? So it's like, imagine if one drop of blood, you can really store so much information because there's a, you know, tons of DNAs within like a, a, a single drop of blood. But of course, right now, we are not testing it with uh, blood. They're testing it with uh, liquids, gels, and, and, and fluids. Uh, so it's very interesting. They have already done DNA computing. It's already like out in the media. You can research about it. It's done. The thing is that it's very expensive to 
be able to <laughs> do DNA computing right now. Uh, it's just a matter of time, I think, that uh, they reduce the cost of DNA computing in terms of the, the brain, and then you'll make it like more accessible to people. So it's just a matter of time, I think, uh, that it becomes a public thing. But yeah, it's a very interesting topic. Uh, you can research on it. Uh, yeah, give it another maybe five years or something, then it hits the public market, uh, I think. So of course, it needs to be biological, uh, biologically safe and stuff. So yeah. Okay, so uh, how do I reduce the size? Okay, so we have all these buzzwords. Now let's look at the data processing side of things. So with IoT, we are collecting a ton of data, right? Mm. Okay. I'm going to just draw it out here again. Just the gist of it, because we're lacking some space. So now let's talk about data processing. We have a few more buzzwords. And that would be... data mining, your IoT which generates the data, and of course, how can we forget our dear open source data, right? Everyone loves open source. Okay. So, we have a ton of data coming in. The next big thing is kind of like, okay, great. How do we process the data? So when you talk about data processing, a few things come into mind, right? I'll just put it all here. First thing about data processing, can you do it in real time? Sometimes real time doesn't really matter, right? If let's say I want to just monitor some data and then look, at, look back at it in like uh, maybe two weeks or something like that, some people don't, don't really care about real time, but it is a buzzword, definitely, whether you can do it in real time or not. Um, and then also you're looking at the integrity of the data processing, the integrity of it, and so on and so forth. Uh, when I talk about integrity, I'm talking about a, a little bit about the security of it and, uh, you know, since you're handling so much data, whether you actually get lost and whether, and the most important thing about data processing is, can you get meaningful data out of it? So with data processing, you have your new buzzword, which brings us nicely back home to artificial intelligence. So, I'm sure you heard the terms like big data. Big data processing, where people come up with, you know, programs to try to make sense of data. Make sense of data with Excel sheets, with uh, proprietary algorithms, uh, with data visualization. There's a ton of startups just focused on data processing. So artificial intelligence is just another branch of startups that uh, do data processing. No big deal, really. So I'm going to clarify some things about uh, artificial intelligence because right now it's a big hype. You know, people think, seem to think that it's black magic. Um, they think that it's going to take over the world, but I mean, it's not. Whatever, I, one thing I realized is that whatever concepts that men don't understand, they, try, they think it's black magic and it's going to take over the world and go like, oh, it's God. But honestly, it's not. <laughs> okay, so a lot of artificial intelligence, you're going to hear things like, you know, uh, it's rule-based systems, logic-based systems, etc. A lot of it is still uh, rule-based systems. So, yeah. Okay. Hmm. Okay, anybody knows the difference between machine learning and deep learning? No? Yes. Yes. Correct. So artificial intelligence is this big umbrella, right? That says that it's a 
artificial intelligence. You know, it does its own data processing and stuff like that. It can do uh, supervised learning and unsupervised learning. So artificial intelligence is kind of like the big umbrella of things on how it can actually process by itself. And then under artificial intelligence, you have machine learning. So machine learning has existed since par my parents' generation. You know, it's uh, a lot about um, feature-based extraction and things like that. And then under machine learning, you have deep learning. So deep learning is a subset of machine learning, which is a subset of artificial intelligence. Does that give you a very good idea? So artificial intelligence is a very broad and generic term that we just call this whole genre of data processing. Uh, it has been around for a very long time. A brief history about it is that we have gone through two AI winters. So what's an AI winter? So in the past, I mean, during World War II, I mean, you have heard of the great Alan Turing and stuff like that, the Turing tests. Um, so the Turing test, like way back in the day, was that if let's say I am able, you know last time they have these like machines where you tap, 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 and then like uh, you're talking to somebody else, but it prints out in like, a carbon paper, a little bit like a typewriter kind of thing. So it's a little bit like a combination of a typewriter and a fax machine in real-time conversation with the other person. So in the, in the Turing test last time, it's kind of like you tap, tap, tap. If you are unable to distinguish that you are chatting with a computer, uh, and you actually think that it's another person, then that passes the Turing test. So that's really the early stages of artificial intelligence in terms of natural language processing. So NLP, that's another buzzword under the subset of AI, AI that you're, uh, you're going to hear. So natural language processing, what we have now is, of course, uh, chatbots, right? When you, uh, when you type on like a help support kind of thing on the government page, you know, there's a chatbot uh, replying you or in terms of your Siri on the phone, etc., that, those, are, those are under the classification of NLP. So back then, Turing time, you know, you have oh, this whole boom of, of AI uh, uh, innovation, and then you have a ton of movies that come out uh, about AI, like, you know, Matthew Broderick in war games and stuff like that. And then the problem happened was that, what the problem with it is that, you know, it was actually making good progress, but when the VCs heard about it, they were like, take my money, take my money. And of course, when they say take my money, they say like, okay, promise me something. You know, promise me that you're going to build this and this and this and this and this. And the startups kind of overpromised in terms of the things that you can do. It's kind of like, you know, uh, you know the VCs who were investing in them did not have a very clear understanding on how the technology works. So the startups, the, the startups back then ended up overpromising. And of course, when they didn't deliver, they pulled out all their funds and then winter, like just like nothing, right? And then after that, a whole new wave came up again. I was like, okay, no, AI is still good. Let's revive the whole AI movement. And then the VCs again was like, take my money, take my money, over promise, winter again. So men didn't really learn from its mistakes uh, twice. It went into AI winters. You can actually Wikipedia history of it. So right now, are we going to go into another AI winter? Because now there's so much hype about AI again. I personally feel no, because the guys spearheading the whole AI movement are people who actually know, their, know, know what they're doing. Uh-oh. Yeah, who, who know what they're doing. So there are people, people leading the frontiers of the AI uh, innovation curve. It's kind of like Google, Facebook with their open source projects. And now a lot more people have a clearer understanding of what AI is, uh, how AI works. So later I'm going to teach you how to talk to an AI geek. You know, you don't tell them, oh, build me this, build me that. But how do you actually uh, talk in terms of AI terms? So yeah, uh, that's a brief... Uh, okay, did I miss out anything? No, okay. Now, let, let, this is a nice, very nice segue. Okay, how do you actually speak AI? Mm. <coughs> Okay, let's not go into the tacky, tacky part first, but let's talk about what it can do and what it cannot do. So, let me give you a very good example of what it cannot do. Okay, it's already, boy, uh, it, I mean, in terms of what, okay, cannot do. I went into a meeting with Sergi Cisco, the head of their innovation department. Oh, wait, shit, I shouldn't say this. Okay, cannot scrap it. Okay, uh, <laughs> right, NDAs. Mm. 
Okay, I went into a meeting with this very big short guy. Uh, it is a different case, okay, by the way. So I have a meeting with a very big short guy, and then he says like, hey, Annabelle, I want you to replicate the Amazon Go store in Seattle for me. You know the one where Yeshi can like, pick up a bottle of water and just walk out of the shop and then it just builds your account, you know? Uh, they use a combination of sensors and computer vision and all these kind of things, right? And he says, I just want it with computer vision. Oh, by the way, right, computer vision is a, sub, is a, is a subset of uh, artificial intelligence. The official term for computer vision is IVA, Intelligent Video Analytics. So purely with IVA. And I was like, me, just me. I was like, yeah, just you. And I was like, you know, it, Amazon is a very big company, right? We have like uh, uh, thousands of employees and like their business is pretty much gathering data. I was like, yeah, I know. But you see, they didn't come up with this overnight. They've probably been working on it for the past 10 years. And in the past 10 years, they probably did not have the innovation that we have today. You are really the frontier of Singapore's uh, AI scene. I think you can do it. <laughs> and I'm like, right. And you just want it with computer vision and nothing else. I was like, yeah. I was like, nah, nah, -uh, I'm not going to do that. Right? I mean, even so, like the, the user experience of it, right? If, let's say you have a camera pointed there right in, the, in, right in front of you. I mean, there's limitation with camera. I'll, I'll talk about that later for IVA. But even so, it's like, how do you actually go into a meeting and request for an AI technology stuff. It's like very often you, it, uh, it, it, it's like not, yeah, you, you just meet people who don't know how to speak AI. So the thing about how do you speak AI? Um, as an AI practitioner, I feel that it's your responsibility to actually be the one innovating the products. You cannot rely on the person from within the company to say, build me this. Because most of the time when you tell them, hey, what do you want? They'll be like, Oh, you sure you want to ask me what I want? I want the moon, you know. They are, they are, they are, it's a very conceptual idea of AI that they have, but when it actually comes to the deployment of it, they have no clue on how it works. They, have, they think it's some sort of magic that, oh, you know, uh, as long as they see in a movie, it can be real. Uh, and like with any technology, it has its own limitations. So the core essence of AI, when you talk about project uh, management, you are looking really at the features, right? So for example, if I have a model that is trained in facial recognition, something simple that we are familiar with, facial recognition, to be able to recognize a person's face, it is not the same as a facial, facial expression model, right? So yes, it's still looking at the face, but facial recognition is pretty much saying that hey, I am able to compare your face with the criminal database of face. I'm able to distinguish that your eyes are here and your nose is here, your mouth is here, and how big it is probably. And maybe based on facial, ex uh, facial recognition, uh, I can uh, also, because by taking the average, the, guy, the, the average distance between two people's eyes is more or less the same, right? Using that as a scale, I can actually estimate your height. It might not be the most accurate estimation, but it's a good estimation. You know, so that's... That's a plus feature in terms of height. That one's not really deep learning, but it's more of like a data processing, right? That, which is what AI is pretty much about. So the actual model, facial recognition, is one model. Facial expression is a different model, right? To be able to detect that I, how many percent happy, how many percent sad, how many percent angry, that's a totally different model. There are two different features. So to just say that I, am, I, I analyze uh, faces with, with deep learning or AI, you know, it's too generic. So in terms of features, you need to be very specific. So when you say, okay, if let's say I'm a startup, how are you able to, yeah, sorry, if I am the end client and there are 10 different startups in front of me that says, I do facial recognition, how do I know which startup to go with? Who do I actually pay the money to? I'm not going to pay to all 10, right? And then have like 10 duplicates of facial recognition software. How do I actually choose and, and decide that this startup for facial recognition for AI is better than the other one? So, of course, different companies have their own different ways of judging. For me, I judge it based on just two criteria. The first one is, how accurate is it? 
So accuracy would mean that, okay, let's say if the camera is here, I scan it from here, it's able to detect, right? But if, let's say, I turn my face a little bit, like maybe 45 degrees, I still able to recognize my face. Uh, also, even if it's front of view, etc., how many percent, I mean, like what we call confidence interval, like how, how much guarantee can you give it, uh, give me that, you know, it is actually my face and not somebody else's face. So accuracy is a very big thing. The next one that I judge it on is latency. So latency is pretty much, you know, you want it in real time, especially when you're looking at facial recognition, you're comparing a criminal database and you're having like monitoring like a, uh, 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 MRT station with like thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of people walking across all the MRT station at the same time, you need to be able to do it in real time. Um, so when you talk about latency, usually the thing that gets compromised is the quality. So quality kind of like, okay, the thing when you do IVA is that you have to pick your camera, sorry I sidetracked a bit about cameras, uh, you have to pick your cameras very carefully. The reason being is that if your data input from the cameras, the pictures that you take, is already not clear, it's not readable, it, like let's say the lighting condition has shadow or something like that, right, or it's a bit blurry. If your data input is already not clean, I cannot guarantee 100% accuracy or something like that, or I cannot guarantee, uh, you know, uh, various other things. So if let's say I want it to have real-time computation in terms of latency, usually the thing that gets compromised is the size of the file because they don't have the data, uh, the, the, the computational power to process so much high-resolution files. And when you play with IVAs, when you're using a special machine vision cameras, you can actually set the frame rate per second for the camera. So, you know, video is actually just a series of photos, right? Um, Usually, your, okay, your eye as a, as a very nice benchmark, your eye sees at 24 frames per second. So to be kiasu, uh, you want to set it at like maybe 30 frames per second, or if you are even more kiasu, you can go all the way up to 60 frames per second. So that is really like super high speed. And when you're taking images at like 1080p or 4K, you're saving like 60 frames of 4K resolution or 1080p resolution per second and expect to process the whole thing in real time. That's a bit outrageous, right? So in terms of real time processing, in terms of latency, this is the number one thing that gets compromised all the time is that people have been trying to stinge on the quality of the, of, of the, the, quality of the input. Maybe it's, they take fewer frames per second, maybe they just uh, reduce the resolution of it, etc. So the latency usually, you know, that's another thing to judge it on. So that's why I judge it on, at least. Uh, so yeah, just two things, very simply. Uh, and that's really enough for me to distinguish which is a better facial recognition company. So yeah. Okay, so back to the topic on uh, models. So let's say I, I, I specialize, I am the world leader in facial recognition technology how, which companies, which industries so should I approach? So one thing you'll notice is that a global trend for AI when it first started is that people were obsessed with face. You know, facial expression, facial recognition, and so on and so forth. And then the next thing they went into, which was a very, very hot, uh, very hot uh, industry was surveillance. So surveillance in your home, surveillance in, uh, 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 public areas, su surveillance in real estate buildings, you know. And then people started getting creative. They said, why not let's do, using facial recognition uh, and facial expression, let's go into retail, retail analytics, let's profile the consumers. So when they walk in a store, you can kind of like profile uh, their, their, their things like age and gender based on, you know, like facial features and things like that. You know, all these kind of things is extrapolated based on the data you get. Uh, yeah, using their own proprietary algorithms. So they've been very creative uh, in terms of the industries they go to. So by possessing one model, in terms of one feature, you can really target a lot of various industries. So one thing we realize, uh, that we observe in the AI scene uh, globally is that people tend to stick to the model that they're good at and then sell it to multiple industries. And there comes the problem of a mismatch because if I am a end client and I am let's say uh, a security company like Cisco or something 
I don't want just facial recognition, right? I want to go to a startup uh, or a company and say, hey, I want to monitor a lot of things, uh, 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 the security of this uh, area. I want you to do body posture recognition. I want you to do facial recognition. I want you to do facial expression recognition. I want you to do text extraction, object detection on whether they're carrying a luggage bag or a, or a purse or something like that. And then like these startups, they're pretty much just focus on just one model. So that so and you know they are all scattered all over the place. So this big end client, you know, now they have to do their due diligence to go and find out, okay, body posture, which one's the best in the scene for body posture uh, recognition, who is the best and everything. And that's problem number one. You know, it's all scattered around and they have to do their due diligence to search globally for that specific feature. And the next one is integration. So in terms of uh, when you program on AI, you know, there are a few different um, frameworks that you can use. May, you might have heard of TensorFlow, you might have heard of Cafe, you might have heard of Torch and various other frameworks. So if you want to integrate all these together, you know, it's another pain uh, to go through. You know? uh, so in terms of ad adoption of AI technology, uh, uh, there is definitely a lot of hype, but not yet. Give it maybe another one year or two years before people are really ready to adopt. Right now, people are still excited about IoT. Uh, it takes a while for it to catch up. So yeah, I'll give you some examples of, uh, of things that you know, I've come across in terms of uh, features. So the very beautiful thing about deep learning is that you can custom train models. So when if you recall, Singapore had a rat problem last year at Bukit Panjang. So after Bukit Panjang, the whole rat problem thing, there was a, the rats moved to Bishan. <laughs> and then uh, ST Engineering contacted us and said like, okay, um, we are able to collect data of the rats in the gutters with thermal vision cameras where you hook under the drain cover, right? You can actually collect all the images of the rats and things like that. But I'm not going to manually see through the images to actually count like, okay, this is red number one, this is red number two for like, I don't know, two weeks or three weeks worth of data. So their goal was actually to identify which is the most frequently used tunnel uh, by the rats and then deploy the poison because to put poison everywhere is going to be very expensive, right? So it's better if it's targeted, if targeted to the most frequently used one by the rats and also what time. So yeah, they installed the thermal vision cameras. You put, we, we took the images, uh, like 100,000 images, trained it to actually recognize that that is a Singapore rat. So <laughs> Singapore rat, not German rat. It's, it's like you can, so what are the features that we actually base it on? Maybe it's a tail, tail length, uh, the average kind of outlook of it. But by feeding the, okay, so you see when the thing about AI is that you cannot say like, identify a rat and then like poof magically like it's able to identify the rat you need to actually train a model out of it so that's what we'll do I'll, uh, if we have time i'll go through a little bit of the technical side on how uh, something gets trained but the thing is that you feed it with a lot of data for rats uh one problem about data is that you know if you feed it an image the first few images at least you must be able you must label it so within the image, you must actually say like, okay, this thing here is a rat. It is not, not two rats together. Like, you cannot assume that the computer knows that that is one rat, right? You must be able to label it and go like, okay, this is a rat. And then, you can, and then that is another rat. And then you go to the next one, that's another rat, and another rat, and another rat. So just by taking pictures alone, right? It's, yes, it's very good to have clean and clear uh, images. But then uh, the next problem is like, how do you label the images? So like for two or three days, we we're just staring at like 100,000 images of rats. <laughs> uh, not very fun, but at least they're thermal images, so it's not that bad. Um, so yeah, so yeah, labeling your images. So by, I mean, we can do custom trained models. So let me give you some other examples, um, some, some, something fun. Uh, Singapore Zoo. So we got approached by Singapore Zoo to do uh, this project. We are still in talks about it. On how do you differentiate Kiki the monkey from Coco the monkey from Kaka the monkey. 
So the idea is that behind each monkey, they have a story on how they got rescued and rehabilitated, right? So if you print it out on like a nice card and go like, oh, Kiki the monkey was separated at birth, but right, and Coco the monkey is the brother of Kiki the monkey. And it's like, even if the tourist reads it or like the visitor reads it, they're, they're going to look at that monkey and like, is that Kiki or is that Coco? You know, kind of thing. It's like they're unable to differentiate it. So the thing is, uh, we are, we are going to work with them to kind of like train it to recognize that, okay, this one is Kiki, this one is Coco, and that one is Kaka. So initially, uh, as a proof of concept, you know, you just take a, uh, uh, they have this mobile app, you take a photo of it, and then you're able to distinguish Kiki, Coco, or Kaka the monkey. Uh, and then, uh, if everything goes well, we have a transparent LCD screen. So like, you know, you have like, let's say a raccoon enclosure, so it's like 10 raccoons running around. If it runs in front of that transparent LCD screen, you'll be like, zoop! This is Emily the raccoon. Emily was rescued at birth from a forest fire in Australia, you know, this kind of thing. Uh, so it's, it's pretty fun. To be able to pick up the nuances that the human eye uh, can't is also another, it's another plus for AI. Another thing is that to give you, I mean, these are very fun cases. Let's talk about more economic cases. So in terms of uh, industrial manufacturing, industry 4.0 movement, you know, if you heard about uh, visual inspection, so once you manufacture a component, uh, let's say we have a client who manufactures parts for Boeing Airlines, when the components get manufactured, they must make sure that every single thing is accurate, right? Uh, you cannot afford it, it's Boeing. Or even if it's like electronics, a PCB board, a printed circuit board with like 100 chips on it, you know, right now, like this poor lady in the factory is just like inspecting or like, oh, is that sorted? Okay, cool. And then like, it's just like coming in real time. So there's a pressure be like, okay, the next one. I mean, if, if she just zones out for a bit, right? You know, the accuracy of it, of, 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 of the assurance, just because you have a person there, it's not very assuring. So um, with computer vision uh, and deep learning, we are able to actually pick up all these kind of small nuances. So very funny, uh, I, was one of the, I was at one of the factories of one of the biggest silicon manufacturers in uh, Singapore, they are listed. Uh, they walked me around the factory and they were like, okay Annabelle, wherever you can see your AI technology being implemented, please stop me. <laughs> and then I was like, sure. Because like, right now there's already a machine that does that. I mean, it's not new technology for PCB inspection, it's not new, honestly. But it costs $700,000. Very expensive, so it's usually re reserved for the, the, the manufacturing line that gets you know highest volume per day. Oh, okay, okay, yeah, I, either like a uh, high volume per day or, or the highest value. So they are like, okay, wherever you see, just stop me because my my, my board just cost two thousand dollars, seven hundred thousand dollars, two thousand dollars. So they are like, okay, and I'm like, ah, oh, hey, can we implement it here? And then we stop, and then the guy was like, hmm, very good. That means I don't need these two people. <laughs> and then from inspecting the PCB board, they just looked up at us. And I'm like, what? <laughs> so I was like, no, no, no. We have deployments somewhere. No Singapore foreigner ratio and everything. Oh, come, come, let's go, let's go. <laughs> and I'm like, right. So uh, a lot of times, you know, people think that, okay, AI is going to like take over jobs and everything. But I think it's going to complement in some ways because no... Uh, in terms of education, right, we are moving to a higher level of education. No kid is going to go like, oh, mommy, when I grow up one day, I want to be a PCB inspector. <laughs> you know, it, it, they're facing hir hiring crisis. Even like the young generation when they grow up today, they don't want to do this kind of menial jobs. They want to do something more glamorous. So they're facing the crunch also. And also, you know, we are complementing them in terms of the accuracy that they perform. Because the thing about AI is that it can tell you what's wrong. But to fix the issue, you still need men on the ground, right? To actually unsolder the component and put it back or actually to put it one side uh, and actually do the fixes to it. Or, yeah, I mean, or let's say security to be able to detect that that's a terrorist and then to send a man down. Then you still need a physical guy. Ooh, speaking of terrorists, something very interesting. So, <laughs> yeah. So, okay. In terms of security and, and, and AI, etc. So we talked about models, right? So if let's say the model is, I am able to detect that that is, uh, that is an object. Okay, that is, uh, that is the, this man's pose is like that, and this is a pen, and this is a, a mouse, etc. Very often, when you talk to the end client, they'll be like, okay, very good, very good. Put all these models together, and you'll use it for terrorist detection. And you're like, huh? 
Okay, so do uh, you want us to do the whole thing uh, for you? Because it feels like you want us to do the whole thing. They will come to a point where they say, no, I don't want you to do the whole thing because it's very controversial. How do you, how, how do you classify someone as a terrorist, right? Just because by skin color, color you know, it, just because the guy is, let's say, a darker shade of, 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 of skin color, or be, maybe because he has like cloth all over the face, you know, all these kind of like rule-based systems, all this, the secret sauce behind it, they're not going to tell you. Or even let's say for consumer profiling, like you have like a thousand people walking in front of the board, the, the billboard. How are you actually able to say that, huh, he is the one that's most likely going to purchase my items from a mess or something like that. You know, all this secret source for the business logic, they're not going to, uh, they're not going to tell it to you. So even as an AI startup, uh, one of the problems is that you don't know the problem statement of the industry and they don't want to reveal it to you. How much time do I have left? 15 minutes? Okay, cool. Uh, anyone, are you still okay? Can I go into a little bit more techy side of things? Okay? Yes, okay. Do you have internet here? Um, wireless at SG. Wireless at SG, okay. Okay, I'm just going to very quickly tell you how AI works in terms of the tech side of things. I'm not going to delve very deep uh, into into the various neural net models, but at least you kind of have an idea of how it works. Okay. Huh? My hotspot. My phone is in. All right. Okay, cool. Now my, I'm, I'm just going to make like, if my gestures hasn't been exaggerated, I'm going to make more exaggerated gestures then. Okay. <laughs> okay, cool. Okay. Think of it as this. Uh, I'm going to do it facing you, so yeah. You have your input, right? Your input here. Input layer. And then you have your output layer, right? So the idea is that I'm going to feed it with some information and get something meaningful out of the whole thing. So what happens in between, right? So I am like what we call the hidden layer, okay? So input layer, hidden layer, and output layer. So what we're looking at right now is a single layer uh, neural network, right? You feed it with uh, one in, uh, as in a layer of inputs, some processing happens and then output. Why do I say layer and not thing? Because a layer actually can be several things. So let's say I want to make the perfect laksa, you know? I run a laksa shop. And then I was like, okay, what are the ingredients for laksa? Coconut milk, so you have coconut milk, and then you have uh, curry and then you have various other things right and then what at the end of it i want to get the recipe for the perfect laksa that everybody likes okay so that's my final output so in the hidden layer it's very it, it does the processing so now we are gonna go one step a little one step a little bit deeper bear with me you have weights assigned to to, to the ingredients. So weights can also represent importance, right? So if let's say coconut milk, okay, uh, we realize that uh, the more coconut milk we add, the happier people are. So maybe coconut milk have uh, a weightage of let's say 10 points. Let's say 10 points and plus a combination of uh, let's say uh, uh, two units of curry sauce and maybe uh, three units of lime leaves, etc. You know, you have now uh, uh, aggregation of this coconut milk times the units plus uh, the lime leaves plus its un times its units plus the curry sauce times its units, right? So now you have the aggregated thing here. But that's only use case scenario number one. What if, let's say my, like I find this most appealing to me. What if somebody else like something else, which is also made out of a product, some end product of uh, the various uh, ingredients, but maybe they place different emphasis on different units, right? So now you have the hidden layer, you have different possible outcomes. So that's, it's kind of like, okay, yeah, there's, there's this, this scenario here. And then, uh, you know, at the end of it, you just need one laksa recipe, right? So using the same concept, you can't have like this thing and this thing and this thing and this thing and this thing the, in the hidden layer, different options in the hidden layer. You actually compare with the final one. 
the final laksa that actually comes out. So, okay, I think like, okay, now I have the perfect business model for the best laksa recipe. Using this, I start selling my laksa. And then I realized, uh-oh, you know, based on customer feedback, it's not a 100% hit. Maybe I'm selling like 70% uh, uh, of the laksa and not like 100% of the laksa. So it'll be like, okay, I need to make some adjustments to it. So then again, it'll be like, okay, there is the difference between the actual uh, result of the laksa, the actual one that we are expecting to happen versus my theoretical one. The difference is what we call the cost function. So taking this cost, cost function, you can actually adjust, go back, trace it back, adjust the, the importance, the weights and, and, and uh, to the various ingredients. You keep adjusting back and forth. Right? So this is where we have the learning process happening. So taking it to the computer's context, you know, uh, we are not looking at just one single layer. Right? We are looking at facial recognition, facial expression. Maybe one layer is the eyes, one layer is the nose, one layer is this, or maybe one is vaguely detect detecting the ages of the face, and then now it's trying to make sense of, let's say, within other than the ages of the face, you are looking at the ages of your eyes and things like that, features. So there, there are tons of layers in between, and the process, the idea of you know, comparing with the actual data that you're expecting to get, back and forth, you are able to adjust this uh, process automatically without you know, somebody actually doing it. So there comes the idea of supervised learning and unsupervised learning. So you can go and uh, search up a little bit on it. Unsupervised learning is very interesting. Um, yeah, but a lot of the times it's uh, what we call rule-based. Uh, <laughs> never mind, uh, ignore I say that. Just uh, search up on like, uh, the different layers of artificial intelligence, as in different layers of uh, neural networks. So one thing I wanted to show you is that the different models uh, that are available out there, so neural networks can get very complicated. Every day, uh, maybe every day or, or at least every other day or every month, um, you know, new kinds of neural network models are forming. So what I showed you is a very linear one, right? Like, like input layer hidden layer, maybe two hidden layers, maybe 10 hidden layers, maybe 100 hidden layers, and then an output layer. But we have seen very recently some very disgusting yet beautiful in terms of artistic value. Uh, uh, what neural net models look like. So. <coughs> There's this very famous uh, thing, the zoo. Ta-da! So, okay, so uh, previously, right, I was talking about this neural network. It looks something like that, right? You have your input layer, your hidden layer, and then your output layer. So, maybe, so this is like my ingredients for laksa. With the arrows, I'm assigning weights to it. So you see, pointing to this hidden layer is actually a combination of all three. It might not necessarily be all three. Maybe it's just two for some of them. And then based on all this, you know, you kind of have an like output. It can be one output. It can be two outputs. You know, uh, it really depends. And of course, you get more complicated ones like that later on if you want to add more hidden layers. Um, it depends already on what is the kind of information that you want to process. So uh, yeah. So this is a very linear-ish one. The zoo is pretty interesting. You get fun ones that look like that, and that, and that, and that, and that, and that, and that. So, uh, I mean, depending on the kind of neural network model that you're using, you can really push the boundaries of it. So we have this thing called Generative Adversarial Network, GAN, uh, where you are able to actually, uh, okay, so, so GAN is something very interesting. Okay, they didn't specify. Okay, so uh, use case application for GAN is kind of like, I'm just going to feed it information saying that there is a girl in a black room holding a pen. And then they suddenly, you know, based on this text, saying that there is a girl in a black room holding a pen. 
they are able to actually come up with a visualization of a girl in a black room holding a pen. And what kind of pen, they will also just pick and choose one of them. So you generate, I mean, depending on the kind of neural network that you use, uh, you are able to actually come up with different kind of uh, results. Some would be predictive, some would be, you know, uh, historical analysis, some would be various other things. Uh, so yeah, GAN is pretty much, um, I think, I think it'll be used very widely in VR and gaming initially. And then the, the joke that we have in the AI scene is that uh, GAN is only useful for one thing, porn industry. But never mind, <laughs> ignore, ignore I said that. Uh, keep it to yourself at least as you do with all porn. Um, so yeah. Um, yeah, okay, I think I'm running out of time. But I'll, I'll uh, to very quickly summarize. Um, AI is definitely a buzzword, but don't let it over excite, excite you. Uh, we are still very, the, the, the hype precedes the actual technological innovation that is actually happening. You hear a lot of talk about autonomous cars, you hear a lot of talk about you know, what it can do, but the actual deployment of it, there is a lot of barriers that we need to overcome first. Uh, the most basic barrier to overcome is education, knowledge, in terms of the people who are going to be implementing it. Because many a times you see... Your attention please. Sorry. Help us make the library a conducive place for learning for all our users. Parents, please ensure that your children behave and are quiet in the library. Thank you, children, for not running, shouting, scattering books, or climbing on library furniture. Staff will request users who do not cooperate or misbehave to leave the library. Mm. Thank you for your understanding and cooperation. So yeah, um, there are a lot of barriers uh, to entry uh, in terms of deployment of AI. So it's one thing to be an enthusiastic hobbyist who wants to learn about AI, but then you ask, what can I actually do with this technology? So if you are, supposed, if you are to get started on AI, uh, I would recommend this approach that is the least, uh, that, that, that burns your wallet the least, okay? So you want to try to invest as little money into it until you are comfortable. As a, I'm talking from a hobbyist level, okay? Uh, go and search for things like Google Vision API. Okay, Google. So these are open source stuff that uh, you can just uh, integrate within your code. So things like natural lang text processing, natural language processing, uh, video analytics, object detection, all these kind of things. It's really simple, it's just an API. So once you are comfortable with playing the API, API, you get a sense of how it works and how it doesn't work, then play with the cam cameras. Because you know, you ha you are now that you're comfortable with the software, you want to have more control over the data that you are feeding into the software. So I'm assuming that when you're playing with this uh, software, the Google Vision APIs and, and uh, various API cloud services, uh, you're using off the web images that you find or, or, or things, you're not really generating your own data or even if you do, it's just like very uh, basic level. So I want you to explore more into you know, uh, collecting your own data. So in this phase, you're gonna question yourself if you're uh, you looking into vision analytics, is that do I need an IP camera? Do I need a web camera? Or do I need to spend $1,000 on a machine vision camera? You know, how far do you want to push the limits to? And then once you're comfortable with that, then I want you to look at building your own models. So... <laughs> Dear readers, the library will be closing in 30 minutes. If you wish to borrow library materials, we advise you to do so now at our self-check machines. We thank you for your visit and hope to see you again soon. Yeah. So uh, the thing is that you know you get to you play with your own models. You don't want to be so reliant on uh, a secondary party like Google or Facebook, etc., on their APIs. You actually want to try building your own neural net, your your own model, right? So that that is a very challenging part. So it really. Uh, it's really good if you have a strong foundation in C++ and uh, Python. And then once you're comfortable with that, 
then you explore the hardware architectures of training it. So initially, all this training, I'm, I'm assuming you're going to use Amazon Web Services, etc. That, but once you're comfortable with that, you know you can look at building your own custom computer or actually purchasing a, a, a various device specifically for training or maybe specifically uh, for deployment. So edge computing devices are pretty much deployment devices. Uh, to train it, you actually uh, would buy like a Nvidia Titan X or a graphics card or something like that and build your own computer. So that one's really a heavy investment. So don't go there yet. Uh, if let's say you want to get started on AI. So uh, when you build your own models, uh, you are pretty much quite up there already. <laughs> uh, you can actually consider doing a startup based on AI, a software startup based on AI. So uh, there's lots of possibilities. Um, right now you'll see that the security industry is very saturated. So I would urge you to be more creative, uh, explore the various uh, 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 Industry. So, for example, retail industry. Uh, if let's say everyone picks up these objects and go like, oh, very nice, this mouse is very nice, and they see a price tag, it's like, oh shit, it's two thousand dollars. I'm not gonna buy it. You know, all this kind of analytics is not captured within the system. So, how you would program uh, AI software to actually capture this analytics is kind of like first, I need to be comfortable with object detection model to actually identify that this is a mouse. And the next model I need to identify is that this is a person approaching the mouse. And how many people are, once you're able to actually identify that's a person, it's very easy for you to do the people counting, to say that, okay, there are three people uh, around this mouse at this certain time. So object detection, people detection, uh, if you want to push it one step further, you can do a profiling of the person, uh, what's their reaction when they actually look at the mouse. And then from there, it's really just data extrapolation uh, and, and, and basic data analytics things like comparing this data with the inventory system to see whether uh, it matches into a percentage. Like if let's say 100 people linger around this mouse in uh, one hour, but there's only one sale, is there something wrong with it? So that's where the business logic will come into play. So uh, yeah, if you want, you can check out some of the causes for deep learning online. There's a lot of res uh, resources. The most famous one would be the one by Andrew Ng, a Singaporean. Uh, yeah, Andrew Ng from. Yeah, huh? All oh, right. Machine learning. Okay, whoops. Yeah. So, yeah, there are a lot of resources online. You can just do a quick Google search for it. Uh, I would advise you not to skip the basics. It does help if you have a mathematical understanding of how it works. And from there, it's going to help with uh, your, your, your entire deep learning process. Because if your basics is not strong, um, you're going to have a hard time actually keeping up with the developments in AI. And it's moving very, very fast. So a strong foundation will definitely help. So I think uh, I will end my talk here. So yeah, thank you.